good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Robert Carnworth, um, and welcome to this uh, occasion to mark the 25th anniversary of the passing of the Aarhus Convention. Um, as you may know, I used to be a Supreme Court judge until I retired in um, just before the first lockdown three years ago. Um, and since then, I've been an associate member of Landmark Chambers, which you probably know is one of the leading environmental law barristers chambers. I'm very honored to be asked to chair this session. Um, the Aarhus Convention um, was very much a major step forward for those of us who are interested in environmental justice. And as you obviously know, it had sort of three main pillars, the right to uh, access to information, the right to public participation, and the right to access to justice. And um, I, uh, I remember, of course, it was the last one which interested me particularly as a judge and um, because the importance of the right was it wasn't just any old justice, but it was justice which had to be fair, prompt, and not prohibitively expensive, which is quite an issue, at least in this country. Um, now, we're going to, we've got three um, speakers from slightly different perspectives, but all with substantial experience of the significance of the convention. Um, we have David Wolfe, KC, who is a very well-known and experienced advocate in environmental cases and has done many cases at all levels. Um, and indeed, I've had the pleasure of hearing his submissions on a number of occasions, not always successful, but certainly always informative. Um, we have uh, Gillian Lobo, who is the head of litigation at the environmental law charity Client Earth, who have been really at the forefront of over many years of leading the way on um, environmental litigation. And again, I've had the pleasure of hearing their submissions and working with them. And then lastly, someone who needs no introduction, I suspect to any of you, which is Chris Packham, who is a very well known TV presenter and naturalist. Um, and uh, has enormous experience. But in addition, he is one of the directors of the charity Wild Justice, which um, has the purpose of both improving the legal system that governs nature and the environment, but also using it to um, carry out cases and have a real impact on practices. And so each of those will be talking about the um, convention from different aspects. We'll start with David Wolf, who will set the background of the act and the main features of it and some of the ways he's been able to use it in practice. We'll then move on to um, Chris, who will talk about how wild justice has been able to use the convention. And then finally to Julian Lobo. Uh, um, who will talk about client Earth's experience and indeed her own experience of using the convention. And then we'll have a, a time for a discussion between the speakers and then a chance for questions and answers. Um, and I hope you'll use the question and answer function on your screen to um, pose any questions you think would be useful. And we'll come to those later on. We've only got an hour for the whole show, so we need to move ahead quite promptly. I should say that this session is being recorded and you'll be able to pick it up um, subsequently on the Green Alliance website. So without more ado, I will ask David to start by introducing us to the convention. Thank you, Robert. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so uh, my name is David Wolfe, as Robert says. Um, I'm going to talk for a brief five minutes about uh, some aspects of the Aarhus Convention relevant to the UK, including just starting, if I may, with introducing um, the, the, the sort of sequential process by which uh, certain elements of the Aarhus Convention have become embedded in our litigation and have had considerable impact on um, our judicial reviews. 
So uh, the convention itself, uh, as you know, was signed 25 years ago yesterday. That's why we're uh, having these various celebratory events, I guess. Um, uh, the UK was one of the original parties to that and very involved in the original negotiations um, that took place in Aarhus. Um, the UK then uh, ratified the convention in May of 2005. Um, important observation about uh, that ratification because the UK made a reservation at that point. So um, the, the convention itself conveys um, several different strands of environmental pr protections, one of which is around access to environmental information, one of which is around public participation in decision making, um, and one of which is around access to judicial review type procedures to challenge environmental decisions. Those are the pillars, if you like, of, our, of Aarhus, the convention. It also has, however, an, an Article 1, which sets out um, a right of every person to live in an environment adequate to his or her health and well-being. Now, we don't hear a great deal about that in the UK. That's because at the time of signing the convention and ratifying it, um, the UK entered a reservation, which, of course, um, member states can do, uh, signatory states can do to conventions. Um, and it, it ratified it um, with the reservation that it took Article 1 as being merely an aspiration, um, the content of which was then set out in the other provisions. So right from the get-go, that has um, made uh, Aarhus implementation in the UK has been uh, somewhat hindered. Um, we, we don't yet have, and I'll come back to briefly if I have a moment, um, the Article 1 provisions. However, as I say, um, from May of 2005, the um, UK had ratified effectively the rest of the convention. Um, that led to some early uh, cases, litigation, in which claimants uh, argued in relation to provisions of the Aarhus Convention. Um, principally then, and indeed since, the main issue in play in the UK has been issues around cost, the cost of environmental judicial reviews and statutory challenges, um, and the prohibition in Article 9 uh, 4 of the Convention on Prohibitive Expense in relation to such challenges. Um, I think the UK, when it signed and ratified the Convention, um, took or um, chose to take that prohibition on prohibitive expenses, referring only to the, literally the court cost, the court fee, so a few hundred or small numbers of thousands of pounds, and not including um, uh, litigation costs, lawyers' costs, if you like. So that's how we had this big disconnect over time. Anyway, as I say, early cases looked at um, the convention, but the judges essentially took the view that this was an international obligation, not at that point any incorporation into domestic law, and therefore interesting, but not uh, determinative of any cost decisions. Um, that began to change, um, or that attitude began to change, when there was a working group chaired by the then Mr Justice Sullivan, became known as the Sullivan Working Group, leading to the Sullivan Report in 2008. Um, that group comprised, um, I was involved in it, some uh, private practice environmental solicitors were involved in it, but also academics, members of the uh, representative of the Environment Agency, the Treasury Solicitors Department, um, and uh, a solicitor from Freshfields. So there was a wide range of participation in that. Um, it led its sort of, uh, um, greatest success, if you like, was persuading the then High Court Judge Jeremy Sullivan uh, to put his name to a foreword in which he uh, put his name personally to the observation that um, there was no doubt that environmental litigation in the UK uh, was prohibitively expensive. So that was a very uh, clear sign to the UK and the rest of the world of what was going on. That was very uh, helpful in enabling a complaint that was then brought to the Aarhus Compliance uh, Aarhus Convention Compliance Committee, so that's the mechanism which resolves issues and disputes around the convention, its implementation, and, and which um, unusually allows for um, public uh, petitioning to take place. So many of the matters considered by the committee have been public complaints, and this was just one of those, one of those public complaints. Um, so the Aarhus Compliance Committee was very helpful in its interpretation of various aspects of the, uh, uh, of the convention and, and reached the conclusion um, uh, tentatively and then more de uh, definitively later on that the UK costs rules in environmental judicial review were not consistent with the convention requirements around prohibitive expense. Um, that, however, on its own still wasn't enough in the UK because, again, this was merely uh, an international law body um, expressing that view uh, and in our dualist system not taken, therefore, to be determinative of the domestic position. That, however, changed um, the next step in the history when um, campaigners in uh, rugby wanted to bring a, a judicial review of a decision by the Environment Agency to licence uh, a cement company, Cemex, to burn waste tyres as the fuel in their cement factory. Um, indicative of the way in which things were at that time, um, those campaigners literally advertised in the local newspaper for somebody to come forward to be a claimant 
who in effect, um, and this is more or less what the advert said, is poor enough to be made bankrupt by the costs uh, decision if we lose. Uh, so a gentleman called David Edwards came forward and he initially was the claimant in that case. Um, when he dropped out in the middle of the Court of Appeal procedures, the Court of Appeal invited somebody else, literally at the Court of Appeal's invitation, to substitute as the claimant, um, and Lillian Palakaropoulos stepped in. When she then uh, lost her case in the High Court, the Court of Appeal and the House of Lords, and raised issues about the Aarhus Convention, um, the uh, House of Lords referred questions around the Convention to the uh, European Court of Justice, as it was then called. That was possible because... Um, the European Union was also a signatory to the Aarhus Convention, and its implementation of the Convention had included um, putting the prohibitive expense prohibition um, into various directives, including the EIA directive. So Lillian Palakropoulos was able to raise an issue about that before the ECJ. So when the answer came back, um, importantly saying, first of all, that prohibitive expense did, did include uh, lawyers' fees and also own sides' lawyers' fees, and secondly, was both objective and subjective in its approach. Um, that, that was uh, determinative in basically saying the UK had to bring its procedures into line. Um, that then, of course, led, so Lillian Power Cropper's case before the ECJ was what made that difference, because that was then, of course, through the EU prism, part of our domestic law. Um, that led, of course, to the CPR provision, CPR Part 43, which um, put in place the presumptive caps of five and 35,000 pounds. Um, that has been subsequently tweaked um, to make it possible to adjust those caps. I know Gillian's going to talk a bit more about that, so I won't mention it. Um, and that is where we sit today. We have those caps in place. They haven't been um, uh, adjusted with inflation, which I think is problematic. And the Court of Appeal has made clear they include uh, VAT. So actually, the net figures are less than £35,000 for the claimant. So what with inflation, that now um, leaves, I think, a growing problem. Just uh, a couple of final thoughts, if I may. Um, there are um, several complaints uh, against the UK still in front of the Aarhus Compliance Committee at the moment. If I just mention um, two of those or two topics of those. Um, Article 8 of the Convention requires that there should be um, public consultation or public participation um, in, in the drafting process of uh, legislation. And um, Friends of the Earth and WWF have each got complaints before the Compliance Committee complaining that the UK legislative and, and similar processes don't involve proper public consultation on draft texts. The answer on that is awaited. And then the other one is brought by a consortium of NGOs um, and a law firm, Lee Day, um, in relation to um, the other aspect of Article 9. So I've mentioned the prohibitive expense uh, limitation within there. There's also a requirement that judicial review, as we would describe it, can allow for challenges to, quote, the substantive and procedural legality of any decision. And so the Compliance Committee at the moment is wrestling with the question of what is meant by substantive legality, um, and therefore whether the UK's system, based as it still is around a Wensbury fairly hands-off uh, approach, um, is compliant with that requirement of the Convention. So decision awaited, awaited on that. Other thing, and my final uh, observation, um, uh, a consortium of NGOs, including Wildlife and Countryside Link, Client Earth, RSPB and Friends of the Earth, last week launched what they called an environmental rights bill, which they are going to promote um, to all the political parties in the lead up to the next election um, as a vehicle to not only deal with the point I started with, which is the issues around Article 1, the right to a clean and healthy environment, um, but also a number of other areas in which, in more modest ways, the UK is still not compliant with um, the, the spirit and, and, and the requirements of the Aarhus Convention. So the debate about what Aarhus uh, requires in the UK is still very much a, a live one and issues yet to be resolved. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Chris Packham. I'm a naturalist and a broadcaster, zoologist by training. Forgive my somewhat shadowy appearance this afternoon. I'm cowering in the bowels of the Curzon Cinema in Victoria, where I've just been attending a screening of a forthcoming BBC series that I've made. Um, I've been invited by uh, David and Robert to tell you a bit about the work of Wild Justice and also a case that I took myself using the Aarhus Convention. So 
conservation in the UK is principally managed by a number of NGOs. And a few years back, two colleagues of mine, Ruth Tingay and Mark Avery and myself, determined that there was a, a niche that was currently vacant when it came to addressing urgent conservation measures that in the UK. And that was that due to the expense, um, conservation organisations weren't taking cases asking for judicial review. There'd been a number of no notoriously expensive cases prior to that, um, whereby it was raised by the Charity Commission that the uh, members of those charities probably didn't ought to be uh, spending their money to such a great extent on those cases. And they may have had a valid point um, that was, would be one of uh, perspective. So in 2018, we set up a not-for-profit, not a charity, but a not-for-profit called Wild Justice. And our mission was working with uh, David Wolf and our solicitors at Lee Day, who have been exemplary throughout. We've looked at cases relating to the health and well-being of UK wildlife. And we kicked off by looking at some issues surrounding the lack of hunting regulations in the UK, and in particular to a group of licenses called the General Licenses. And I just have to give you a little bit of context as to what that's about. In the UK, it is forbidden essentially um, to shoot wildlife. Um, you have to have a, a, a license to shoot specific types of wildlife at specific times, unless, a, 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 they, these species appear on something called the general license list. I, I'm simplifying this as best I can. So this would mean that you would be able to, without license, but only with the yours or the landowner's permission, shoot these animals at, at pretty much any time of year, no close season. So you can imagine that the species that were on this list were those which were previously have been determined to be pests. And that legislation um, that found them on those lists uh, went back a, a very long time. But in the changing environment, let's bear in mind that we've lost 69% of the world's wildlife since 1970 and 90 million birds from the UK um, countryside in a, in, a, in a relatively similar time. Um, we felt that there were species included on that list that were no longer warranted being there. I should also add that, you know, you, even if you're exercising a general license, you should not if you're considering that any of those species to be a pest, simply go out and start shooting them. You should have to, prior to that, implement, try and implement other uh, measures uh, that, of control uh, without the need to, to kill those birds. So we launched, uh, we found some, with David's uh, assistance, uh, we found some traction uh, within the UK legislation for these general licenses. And we essentially, and again, I'm simplifying everything here, called for a review as to which species should be on those lists and how and when the, the control should uh, be implemented. So let me give you an example. We're talking about wood pigeons, of course, um, because they're considered a crop pest. We're talking about rooks um, as they're considered a, a crop pest. We're talking about birds such as the carrion crow, which would have been deemed to be a, a pest for those interested in rearing uh, game. There were also other species on the list, such as magpie, jay and jackdaw, uh, even moorhen and coot, um, which were potentially species that you know no longer wanted any any. any immediate control. So while justice um, was immediately assisted by the cost capping exercise uh, from Aarhus because we could not have afforded, despite the generosity of uh, our crowdfunding success, to have taken any of these cases. And the likelihood is, of course, uh, that you know, we, although they were valid cases to make, and we've never and would never take a case which didn't have a, a valid uh, attempt at essentially winning, we were never going to be assured of winning these because they would require wholesale changes in legislation, um, and therefore they would deemed to be, they would be deemed to be unpopular. Uh, we took the cases and. The most interesting thing to report broadly is that we've appealed for judicial review in a number of those cases, um, but we haven't ever needed to get there. So without being you know, too dishonest, uh, the government bodies that we've taken the cases uh, against have kind of backed down before we've ever needed to get to that point.
and we've seen so therefore significant changes over a period of time um, where we've in interacted directly in England and in Wales to the general licenses, the species that are on those lists and the way that they, those species can or cannot be controlled. It's interesting that after our first couple of cases, um, the uh, bodies in Scotland um, took action without us even having to uh, intervene in any way, shape or form. So essentially we as three in, in wild justice as a not-for-profit conservation entity have managed to effectively change the law and people's perceptions of the, the way that these animals were being controlled. Why did, what motivated us to do this? Well, simply because we saw that these birds were being killed unnecessarily. Subsequent to that uh, and the successes we've had there, we've taken cases against the badger cull in Northern Ireland. Uh, we've explored opportunities to look at water quality uh, with looking at environment agency and off what, and we have another, a number of other cases in play at the moment. And just to wrap up, working with David Wolfe in 2018, 2019, I took a case against the HS2 high-speed rail um, development which is ongoing in the UK and again of course as a citizen I needed to have substantial protection and that cost capping was was really important. Uh, we took the case, uh, we lost and then we took it to appeal and we lost uh, so in the eyes of the law uh, we didn't win. I think ethically we made a very strong point and one of the most important things I think it's worth raising is that although you might argue that I lost both of those cases and while justice has not essentially lost any cases but not been uh, allowed to pursue them, judicial reviews have been refused, the opportunity to even threaten um, applying for judicial re review has been incredibly empowering and it's allowed us to make a lot of noise to talk about these issues and bring them to what wider public awareness and that has to be seen as a very valuable asset to the type of work that we are doing. I've considered that winning is not standing on court steps collecting a, a, a medal uh, or, or, or a cup. It's the ability to open a conversation about something where there is obvious need for change. And the Aarhus Convention has uh, been able to facilitate that both personally and on account of wild justice. And I think, just to conclude properly, the empowerment that we received from that is something which has been widely enjoyed by our supporters. They like the fact that this is justice for citizens. Um, and although our fights have often appeared to be David versus Goliath, it's clear that under the auspices of the Aarhus Convention and exercising that, we've been able to arm our slingshot well and bring down a few giants. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Chris. I found that actually fascinating. I'd love to come back when we have the discussion to hear a bit more about your impressions as a non-lawyer of workings of the legal system. But before we do that, we'll move on to Gillian Lobo, who has actually been operating in a very similar way, but rather longer, and from the perspective of a lawyer. So over to you, Gillian. Thank you. Very much and uh, I'm really glad to be invited to be on this panel. I think it's a wonderful opportunity to celebrate the very important Aarhus Convention and it's a unique focus on the rights of individuals and NGOs to protect an environment and really to echo what Chris has just said, that sense of empowerment. So uh, just by way of background, I've been a defendant litigator for most of my life, initially as a commercial lawyer, and then in government, working on private law and public law matters. So our cost regime for me was pretty standard. That's all I understood. But it was only when I came to Client Earth that I realized uh, and became aware of the Aarhus Convention and its importance and the understanding of this real need for a convention like this in order to protect the environment. So I also found out that our system is actually, the English system is synonymous with uh, prohibitive costs right across the world. And this is not necessarily a badge we want to have, but it is one that we carry. I'm not saying the other systems are 
they're just different. They have their own different obstacles to access to justice. So as I started to work on the Aarhus Convention, I was really blown away with it. And because it went to the heart of how to deliver good government. It's providing members of the public with critical information, allowing them to participate in decision making that's uh, of importance to everyone and giving them access to independent courts when a public authority decision may or decision makers fail and sometimes just stumble. So they need, you know, it gives us access to be able to um, review and look at the, those decisions and see how they impact on the environment and their lawfulness. So, uh, oh, and this is all for the environment because the environment, as we know, and this historically this case cannot speak for itself and needs us to speak for it and needs us to seek justice for it. And why I explained, wanted to explain this journey is because I think it's really important to remember that all the people we engage with, we sometimes just take the Aarhus Convention for granted and the fact that we can access um, its provisions, those that are implemented in our um, legal system. But I think it's really important to remember, remind decision makers, policy makers, lawyers and the courts of the purpose and reason for the Aarhus Convention whenever we can and to make sure that that's put in context when we're seeking to use it before the courts and in, to, in order to influence um, positive outcomes for the environment. So, because uh, especially I think, and this is often forgotten, that environmental litigation is public litigation, public interest litigation, something that we're all trying to do to protect the environment, not to hold up any uh, projects, not to impact on commercial arrangements, but to protect the environment. So, and I think sometimes that message can be lost when we're in the heat of litigation. So it's good to remind those around making the decisions of its purpose. There's very much to say on the Aarhus, but I decided to focus on two areas where I think the rules in England and Wales could be improved. One is the variation of the claimant's cost caps. The other is the requirement to bring a judicial review promptly. So a client, uh, you're probably familiar with our suite of clean air litigation that we brought over a long period of time. And I think they also help illustrate the changes in the cost capping rules over this piece. So originally, uh, the first case we brought was in 2011. This is a case where the UK government accepted that it had not complied with the ambient air quality directive, but said it was not a matter for the domestic court to enforce, but one for the European courts as it was a directive. We therefore had to apply for an all style uh, public interest cost capping order, which uh, was it awarded at the discretion of the court. So you never actually knew if you would get one or not. We did get one, but it was always on the proviso that we may need to um, withdraw if we didn't get one or if the cap was too high. And that's a case where, you know, we had to go all the way up to the Supreme Court. We had to make similar applications at the Court of Appeal and then at the Supreme Court, all through a case um, where we didn't win at the first uh, in the at first instance or in the Court of Appeal. But nevertheless, it was a case where the government had accepted that it was in non-compliance. And so we had to spend a lot of money. And even when we succeeded, um, we were still had to, you know, we didn't recover all our costs. And then in Client Earth 2, this was brought in 2013. We had fixed the fixed cost cap, and that's probably uh, was an excellent and the pinnacle of implementation of the Aarhus caps. So we could just apply and we knew that our cap, our costs would be capped at 10,000. However, the case was still not cheap. It was a very complex case that it involved very detailed uh, expert evidence. So even when we won with a cost cap of 35,000, we still were very much out of pocket 
So it cost us um, money to bring that case, even though we had the cost caps. And then in Client Earth 3, the revised ask host caps of their variations were introduced. Here we had to file a witness statement and seek a cost cap with a risk that it may be varied. On that occasion, because it was still new, neither party applied to vary the cost cap. Again, uh, when we won, we were out of pocket. In another judicial review, uh, we challenged the decision to approve Drax plan to build, um, well, the approval of the Drax plan for what would have been Europe's largest uh, gas plant. So in that case, the defendant did apply to increase our cost gap, both at first instance and on appeal. Our costs were increased to 25,000 at first instance and uh, were maintained at 10,000 on appeal. This now seems to be not an unusual approach taken by defendants. So variation of cost caps. <clears throat> From my understanding, the MOG doesn't keep good records of cases uh, where the parties apply to vary. So we don't have that much information about when they're granted and what level. But anecdotally, we know that it's usually the defendant who has the cost cap increased, but the defendant's cost cap is not uh, similarly increased. I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes on thinking about the time incurred in, in applying for cost caps by all parties in environmental cases, especially now that we see commercial interested parties taking a more active role in seeking to increase the claimant's caps. Is this really meeting the requirement of the Aarhus Convention? The current process is burdensome for all parties and the courts, but we need to remember that the Convention imposes an obligation on the UK to ensure that the costs are not prohibitively expensive for the claimant, not the defendant and the interest party. So just think of only the, if only the claimant could apply to vary the costs if it was prohibitively expensive for the particular claimant. We could remove the need for every claimant to file a witness statement for the defendant and interest party to review the information for the court to handle the information and stow what will often include personal information for a judge to determine the issue. How much client and lawyer time is spent on these steps? Do the increases in cases where the defendant's adverse cost caps are increased and the, the claimant is unsuccessful justify this expense imposed on all claimants, defendants and interested parties, not to mention the court's administrative and judicial time? Um, this approach won't open the floodgates because claimants still have to fund their own costs, which in itself is often prohibitively expensive. No claimant brings a legal claim lightly, but de defendants and interested parties can use the process to increase the claimant's own costs, uh, introduce uncertainty and make it more difficult through the financial risk for members of the public to have access to justice and speak for the environment. Another point that I just wanted to highlight is that of what it is in the rules called uh, promptitude or the issue of having to bring your case promptly because this seems to be given a second lease of life. Uh, under the rules, um, claims must be brought in three months but must also be brought promptly. But the question of promptness creates uncertainty. The need to bring the claim within three months or six weeks in a statutory review is already a punishing schedule for a claimant. We have so much to do and you know if we want to go through a full and thorough assessment process before bringing a case then you need the time in order to do that. In our clean air litigation, um, expect, especially the second one, a uh, very expert focused challenge, we had to rely on the ECA decision um, in a case of Uniplex which allowed us to bring a challenge up to the three months the landscape has now changed, and despite the UK giving assurances to the Aarhus Committee that promptitude is not an issue, we are seeing it increasingly argued in challenges we bring. I acknowledge that the cases I'm thinking about relate to legislation introduced by West, the Westminster Parliament, but I understand, and I could be wrong, that in Scotland and Northern Ireland, the requirement for an application to be brought promptly has been removed. 
so that the only requirement is for applications to be brought within three months. We need the uncertainty that the requirement of promptness creates in England and Wales to be removed. So uh, as I've only got five minutes, I'm going to um, leave that there. I don't want anything I've said to distract from the importance and celebration of the Aarhus Convention. The fact that I'm able to identify these improvements is because of the existence of the Convention and all the hard work of those who've conceived, drafted and ratified it, and those individuals and NGOs who continue to work on implementing it in full in the UK. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Um, that's a very interesting perspective from Planned Earth. Um, I, I think I sort of recognize some of those cases which found their way to the Supreme Court when I was there. Um, but I can see that it does raise all the difficulties even with something like the Authors Convention. Um, now, I think at this stage, we are gonna get everyone back onto the screen, if that can be organized somehow, if people can, um, yeah. So we can see them and unmute them. Um, Julian, David, can you, Join us. Um, Chris, you're with us, I can see. <laughs> uh, I'm very interested with what your account, because I, I was sort of, I wasn't aware of the, the work of Wild Justice. Um, to what extent have you actually publicized your activities? It just that I haven't been reading the right things, or because it does seem to me that it, um, it would, given your profile and the fact you're very well known public figure, to hear from you more about the way the convention has worked would be very interesting and actually would meet the point that others were making that how can we get the public more involved. Do you want to comment on that? Yes. Um, well, if you haven't heard of us, then clearly we're not doing that part of our job properly. We must up, up our game, to be sure. Um, I think that our, the one thing that we can state with certainty is that, that those who have different opinions about the way that the law should be implemented or upheld in the UK have certainly heard of us um, because their response has been vociferous and often violent, unfortunately. <laughs> but that, that's down to the type of people that we're, we're dealing with and, and has become part and parcel of the way that, 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 that we work. Um, we publish uh, uh, a regular newsletter and regular blogs and we communicate on social media and we've done really well when it comes to crowdfunding to cover uh, our our costs and the I say really well we do better with things that which have a broader interest so our water case we received you know the funding that we required in a very short space of time it's taking a little longer for some of the wildlife related cases but I think that um we found great favor. And I think the reason for that is because, as I mentioned, there's that David and Goliath um, type of uh, appreciation. I think the, you know, the Brits champion the underdog and we've been seen as an underdog here. We've taken on the UK government. We've asked for reform. Um, we've only been able to do that, as I've said at the outset, down to Aarhus. Um, and, and people have appreciated that. I think if we're guilty of one thing, it's not making as much of uh, you know the Aarhus Convention of how we've used it, and we maybe we ought to do a quick um, mail out and a blog now to celebrate that because without it we, we it would nothing would have been facilitated. And what we've seen is that initially we were interested in as, as I said uh, either non-existent or poorly regulated hunting practices in the UK, but due to interaction with the people that have supported us, we've now spread our wings and we're able to address other issues, a, a number of which are sort of bubbling under, so I won't mention them now but the key thing is i think that having the security of knowing that there will be a cost cap in place although that still is onerous I'm, i won't deny that it hasn't been onerous particularly when we first started it, it's been empowering and also um, has allowed us to take these issues to wider to a wider public and certainly, you know, with, when it comes to the general licenses, uh, and we've now expanded that away from just the uh, the 
the the birds which appear on that license which can be controlled but also looking at, at releases of non-native uh, game birds into the uk we have a critical issue in the uk where by prior to covid and prior to bird flu there were in the region of uh, 50 million non-native game birds being released into the environment every year bring that pheasant and red leg partridge and it has become established knowledge that they are having a detrimental effect in some ways on the UK's uh, landscape and its ecology. Um, and so we have now been pursuing um, uh, you know, cases whereby we're asking for restriction as to how close those releases can be made to uh, essentially areas uh, of conservation uh, value. Um, and again, we're, we're, we're seeing movement. So although we haven't taken any judicial reviews to the full term and, and been smiling outside the court, we've instigated change and reform through the threat of doing so. And that's been a, 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 a really useful thing. And again, as I said, you know, the reason we chose to do this is because the other wildlife NGOs, RSPB, Wildlife Trust, so on and so forth, um, hadn't been uh, doing that at the time. And we found a niche for ourselves and, and the public has responded very positively. And that's, again, uh, we have to say thank you very much to all of those who've endeavoured uh, to, you know, to put together the Aarhus Convention and allow us to do that. Otherwise, it would have been impossible. Good. Well, thank you. I mean, that's very interesting. I'll come on. I noticed one of the questions indeed was uh, to what extent the public, uh, do you, from uh, Antonia S, what extent do you think that the AUKUS Convention requires more public awareness in the UK to enable citizens to understand their rights better? Do you think this would increase the amount of claims being undertaken, or do you think the cost implications are still too off putting? Um, I'll come back. Perhaps Gillian and David I would like to comment on this point about whether. Um, more needs to be done to make the public aware of, of their rights. I mean, I, I should say, Chris, it's, I've been sort of out of things in an active way for three years, so maybe that's why I haven't really been right up to the minute on this, but I'm certainly very interested. Um, uh, David, you, you've advised Chris. Do you want to comment on that? Um. Sorry, am I now unmuted? That's it. Sorry, I think I uh, crossed wires. Um, on, on the issue of public awareness, I mean, I think there is an issue about that, and I think it's partly because um, the public, understandably, think that environmental judicial review or environmental challenges are very expensive, um, and, and that perception may be based, um, to some extent, in the sort of pre Aarhus experience. I mean, that's not to say it's not expensive. It's expensive, but the figures are much more achievable. It's much more achievable to raise five or ten thousand pounds. Um, and find lawyers who will assist you on that basis than it would have been pre Aarhus. So I think to some extent, as a, as a public perception is, is uh, trailing behind what is now possible. And certainly there have been individuals like Chris and indeed others who have crowdfunded to raise the money um, or, or personally funded to be able to raise the money to bring claims, um, uh, which although not common, is now definitely possible in a way that I think historically really it would only have been Sort of footballers and pop stars who could afford to bring the claims environmental judicial review claims pre Aarhus. So I think I think public perception needs to catch up a bit. Uh, Gillian, do you want to come in on that? Yes, I, I think I agree with all that um, David said in relation to that. And I also think, and this is as I referred to my own experience, I think it's something that we should really also be making sure that um, lawyers who occasionally get involved in environmental cases or they have the understanding and the background to also engage so I think a wider understanding of Aarhus not it is really important because if we understand the purpose of it then we can all get behind it because you know the environment is something that we should all be protecting and it, it would be also help in the context of maybe them advising their clients and you know as to what the court will look at it i also think um it would help i think it's quite challenging sometimes for our judges who are dealing with these very large commercial cases or other matters to actually put into context the difference of our who so i think they often influence and not unsurprisingly by awarding these higher costs in other cases so that the standard that's being raised is much higher and the, the more of the need to look at 
uh, Aarhus um, caps for claimants in a very individual basis and try and remove this general view of how expensive our costs are just generally, take it out of context and make it very specific to claimants and the need to actually ensure that claimants uh, for their purpose, it's not prohibitively expensive. Yes, thank you for that. I see that um, Carol Day, who knows a lot about this subject, has asked a question. Um, the courts feel quite a hostile place to JR and environmental claimants at the moment, especially at the permission stage. Do the panelists agree? And if so, why might that be the case and what can be done to address it? Um, anyone want to say something about that? David, you've had a lot of experience of this. Um Yes, I mean, I think I think there are a number of different issues in play here. So first of all, um, it's the conduct of public authorities in responding to claims. So very often public authorities um, respond and behave in litigation as if this were sort of hard fought commercial litigation, um, win at any costs, rather than um, appreciating that they have a public role here. Um, uh, and one of the interesting things to in my work on the Environmental Rights Bill, we, we looked at some provisions in Australia where some of the constituent parts of Australia and the Australian uh, national uh, legal framework actually place obligations on defendant lawyers as to how they behave um, in litigation. So a bit like our rules on candor, but covering a range of other things as well. Um, and I don't know how it practice it works, but certainly the rules look quite impressive. So I think there's an issue about how defendants uh, fight back often defending decisions at any price. And I think there's also an issue about some of the, almost the rules in our court, which are very stacked against um, uh, environmental claimants. I mean, the, the whole judicial review process has its roots, as we know, in private law litigation, um, with sort of burdens of proof and, and, uh, and presumptions about evidence and so on, um, all of which are stacked against environmental claimants. Now, um, that doesn't sit nicely with the Aarhus Convention, whose approach is to recognise the public importance of public participation in decision making and also the public's ability to hold public bodies to account for the legality of their decisions. So I, th I think there's a there's a sort of cultural inconsistency really between um, the UK's uh, litigation approach um, and the Aarhus Convention. It's quite difficult to pin it down because it's slightly amorphous and it's around culture. Um, but I think there's a number of ways and the complaint I mentioned to the, uh, to the Aarhus Com Committee at the moment, which is around um, substantive legality and the Wensbury test, that's an example of, of those sorts of things where, where really um, uh, claimants have to um, climb a, a cliff, not just a mountain, but a, a steep cliff um, to, to win in judicial reviews. Um, so yes, there is a problem. Um, I mean, Chris, as a relative outsider, if I can put it that way, to the court system, have you, when you've seen it, have you thought it unfriendly? Uh. Right. OK, I'll be as diplomatic as possible. Um, <laughs> I've obviously been carefully guided by David and 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 the uh, the guys at Lee Day. And I found the whole thing to be an extremely um, productive uh, uh, process. That's the first thing to say. Um, I've been very surprised by how long the process takes and particularly with the public bodies who seem to be able to um, get away with prolonging the experience as much as possible, constantly asking for more time to do what is ostensibly appear to be very simple things so the protraction of the process i think is outside this is outside of Aarhus, of course but the protection of trying to take these in environmental cases seems to be un unnecessary um you know we have always been in the position to respond on time meeting the deadline set in in the course of that litigation but it seems that they constantly ask for extensions. Um, this goes on and on for months and months, way beyond what I would consider to be acceptable deadlines. And I think potentially that's part and parcel of a, if they kick it into the long grass in, in, in enough times, you might forget about it and go away or, or lose impetus. So I think if I were to change one thing, and I don't think I'm a particularly impatient person, I'm an understanding person when it comes to process, but it can be very, very frustrating to, to keep being, you know, kept waiting by the statutory bodies and the government agencies. But no, I mean, I, I, I felt empowered as a citizen taking the HS2 case. I felt I had great guidance uh, from, from David and his colleagues throughout, of course. Um, and, and, and it gave me, as a broadcaster, a platform to talk about the environmental ills of HS2 which otherwise I would have found how hard to maintain. So it 
we have to think of these cases as not only serving justice, but serving ethical and moral concerns. And that is that we have a, 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 a right and a role to inform people as to what's going on and what's wrong about it. Right, thank you. Um, David, I mean, do you want to comment on that? I, 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 you said it's out, timeliness is outside Arthur's. I think it's clear that one of the requirements is the proceedings should be timely. So I think it's very much part of it. David, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, well, I think, I think the, um, well, you're, you're, you're right, Robert. Um, uh, uh, Article 94 does talk about timeliness um, as well as primitive expense and, and various other things. Uh, I think the point Chris is making is um, we have seen in, in a number of cases recently, and it's become almost routine, that there's a judicial review pre-action protocol um, that, that claimants are expected to comply with and expected, as Gillian said, to um, act promptly and, and so on. Um, and, and the government, uh, particularly the government legal department now, routinely um, doesn't just ask for, but takes for itself more time to respond. So um, it's, a, it's a very odd situation, really, because the essence of a judicial review is you're asking about the legality of the decision as it was taken at the time, often by reference to documents which either existed or they didn't exist at the time. Um, so a 14 day response, which is what the protocol calls for, doesn't seem to be unreasonable. But I can't remember the last time we had a, a response in 14 days. They routinely say it's going to be 28. And then we've just had one um, in relation to the um, carbon budget delivery plan, the successor to net zero strategy, where um, for Friends of the Earth, I think they, they took for themselves three extensions. So the 14 days, I think, became 42 days to respond to the claim. So I think that's the sort of thing that Chris is talking about. Um, mm -hmm. And that does, that does uh, I mean, if you have a, a rule that says claimants have to ask prompt, uh, act promptly, it's all very well for the, for the, um, uh, the government to say, well, we won't take a promptness point in your case. But if they take 40 day, 42 days to respond to your letter, telling you what they knew the minister knew at the time, which is essentially what the letter said, um, you do start start to um, lose faith in the way that Chris is describing. Yes. Gillian, do you have similar experience? Uh, yes, very similar experience. And also, I think it's the lack of um, openness, the whole um, intention behind the pre-action protocol, which is a very good intention, is to try and avoid the need for a judicial review and to save everyone the time and money and before uh, the need to file. But what we're actually finding is that even when we get the answers, they're not dealing with them effectively and in the spirit that they should be covering them. And so we can't, so sometimes that makes it very difficult to make a decision as to whether to go for JR or not. And you almost feel compelled to advise your client that they should uh, because of the lack of information that you're being given at that point. So I think there really needs to be a sort of re-awakening uh, of the need to um, act in the public interest in this litigation, whether you're a government lawyer, uh, especially when you're a government lawyer, I can see with the interested parties, they may be conflicted there because they have to act in the best interest. But certainly for the government, the best interest of everyone is in ensuring that the public interest is served. Yeah. Well, I think we, it'd be useful. I, I note that Carol Day has actually mentioned that there's going to be a, a webinar on Wednesday organized by RSPB, Elf and FOE, analyzing MOG data on environmental claims in case anyone is interested. So in fact, this is a debate which will carry on. And I think we do need more information about practicalities. Um, I should also mention, someone's asked, which chambers I came from. My role, I, I'm as a retired judge, of course, I'm in slightly odd position, but I'm, in, I'm an associate member of Landmark Chambers, which does a lot of environmental cases. And indeed, I think a, a Landmark, or if you go to their website, there is a blog on the Warhol's Convention. Um, now we're coming to the end. I should just, some, um, someone, oh, I think it's again, Carol has asked for David, what difference would a legal right to a clean and healthy environment make if it were to be implemented through an environmental rights bill? Um, that's slightly fringed at Warhols, but David, do you want to comment on that? Um, of, of course. So, so as I mentioned um, in my opening, uh, a consortium of, of NGOs um, has uh, prepared this draft text, essentially as a discussion piece leading up to the next uh, election, through leading up to the next election, um, one of which is this proposal to... to uh, put in the in statute book, 
um, something akin to Article 1 of the Aarhus Convention around the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment for everyone. Um, I think that the, the, the thinking behind that is, is partly at least as follows, which is that whilst we have a range of specific protections, say around air pollution or water quality or uh, habitats um, or, or species protection or whatever, they're all quite siloed in their uh, operation and they sit with different regulators and very often that doesn't um, work because the issues involved very often um, lay across different regulators or different regimes. So an example of that is the um, undisputed ghastly state at the moment of the River Wye. Uh, everybody knows that there's a range of factors contributing to it, including um, house building, uh, farm pollution, uh, a range of other things. Um, that means there are then a whole number of different regulators, some of them uh, local authorities, some of them NR, uh, National Resources Wales, Environment Agency in England, Nat Natural England, indeed government, all of, all of whom um, end up in effect, at least it seems like this, not doing anything because there's too many people involved. Now, um, what a, uh, an overarching right is capable of doing is to is to make sure that all of those actors act and do their bit rather than all of them essentially saying this is not our problem, it's somebody else's problem. So I think I think this is partly about trying to bring a cohesion, but also partly about ensuring that for um, a whole range of public bodies in the same way that equality issues around the public sector equality duty and human rights issues arising from the Human Rights Act are now embedded in their thinking, so too would environmental protection be um, across a whole range of bodies um, uh, in everything they do. So I think it's capable of putting the environment much more squarely into the forefront of public body uh, right. thinking, which, which I hope is, is a good thing. Thank you very much. We've only got three minutes left, I think. Um, I'll give Chris and Gillian a chance, a minute to, to wrap up what they wanted to say. Chris? Well, while justice will press on, we, we feel empowered. We've established a niche for ourselves, acting in the way that we do. We've managed to engender enormous public support. Um, and as a consequence of that, we are con always now open to suggestion. I, I, one thing I forgot to mention, and it's probably the most heartening of all, and that is that since we began in, in 2018 and found our feet in 2019, there have been a number of other similarly small uh, bodies of people who've come together and started to emulate the work in the way that we do it. And, and that's really heartening because that means that, you know, we have shown that we have the capacity to essentially ask for uh, justice for citizens like ourselves and and that message has got out there and and obviously where appropriate we've been working closely with them and, and involve them as as partners but uh, rest assured that on the back of the Aarhus in the condition that it's in at the moment we will continue to make progress and if it improves we'll make even more thank you Brilliant. well done and thank you so much Gillian last words yes well I just want to uh once more think of my thanks to the Aarhus Convention and all those that were involved in it. And I think we can all go from strength to strength. We'll keep a watching eye over it, but it's there and we very much welcome it. Right, well, I think we'll have to wrap up there. Thank you very much to our speakers. Thank you to those who've listened. I think this is very much a sort of taster, but it's obviously a debate that's gonna carry on and there's a great deal obviously to be done to try and coordinate efforts and to look at the ways the machinery can be improved. But I think we come out of this um, with a, a, certainly a positive view, and I think of what the Aarhus Convention has done. And looking back to when I was as a barrister doing these sort of cases, and we had no such cost protection, I think things have been transformed. And I think there's great opportunities to improve that system. So thank you all very much. As I say, this has been recorded, so it can be caught up on the, um, the, the Green Alliance website. But thank you all very much and best of luck with your Aarhus cases. <laughs>